his reign. There will be no hanging chads. There will not be any corrupt machines that vote him in. He is God. So who cares who's in the White House? Riverside Church, located at 3045 Richardson Bridge Road in Princeton, North Carolina. Join us as we unleash the Bible one verse at a time. Hello, congregation. Welcome to another splashing edition of At the River. I'm Pastor Kevin. Of course, you're actually, actually watching At the River, the outreach ministry of Riverside Church, nestled perfectly between Princeton and Grantham. We would love for you to come see us one of our service time out on Richardson Ridge Bridge Road on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. And don't forget midweek service. I want to ask you to go ahead and grab your Bible. And uh, the reason not you not to grab a self-help book or Amazon's, uh, uh, Amazon's bestsellers list is that we choose to believe the Bible. Bible because this is it a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses? They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of prophecy. It's divine, not human in origin. Don't forget at the river, we believe in the five solas. Let's go through them together. Sola scriptura is a Latin phrase. No, I'm not speaking in tongues. A Latin phrase that means the scriptures and the scriptures alone. We don't believe the watchtower, the book of Mormon, someone's personal revelation or dream trumps holy scripture that Christian is under authority of God's holy word and whenever we read the holy scriptures we understand sola fide once again another Latin phrase that means faith and faith alone we believe and have trust and confidence in something but really it's not a something it's a someone and that's sola Christus another Latin phrase that means Christ and Christ alone we believe that Jesus is the only reason that any of us go to heaven and that's where we get the phrase sola gracia a latin phrase that means grace and grace alone if you go to work on monday and you work till friday you earn a wage you earn a paycheck but grace is not like a wage that you earn grace is bestowed upon you the only thing that we earn is the wages of sin and that is death but grace is given to us freely by all loving god and whenever we walk into the throne room of all of theology the shining jewel in the crown of all of theology we'll see sole deo gloria a latin phrase once again that means that God alone receives the glory. He receives the glory of the teaching and preaching of His holy name and His holy word. Certainly in this broadcast of me preaching and you paying attention as we study God's word together, as we look at the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter number 7. And if you've been with us on our Wednesday nights, you know we've been studying the book of Daniel. And I wanted to share this with you as we look at the life of Daniel. At this point, Daniel has gone through the lion's den and he's faced all kinds of adversaries. And he He's face, face to face with Nebuchadnezzar. But now Daniel has grown much older. Daniel has got the wrinkles in his face of years and years of servitude there in Babylon. If you don't know the story of Daniel, Daniel was a young man. He was sacked by the Babylonian army as they marched into Jerusalem. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were taken and they were indoctrinated with those Babylonian cultures and also taught the philosophies. However, God kept his hand on Daniel and his three friends. He even danced with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they were in the fire furnace he was with Daniel and he shut the mouth of the lion but now Daniel is in his older age and he's starting to notice something he's starting to see the country that he's being a part of this very government that he helped administrate start to unravel at the seams he sees Belshazzar the son of Nebuchadnezzar Belshazzar if you are paying attention a couple of chapters earlier Belshazzar is known for throwing orgies and having big parties and then there was literal handwriting on the wall that told Belshazzar through the interpretation of Daniel that that very night his soul will be reaped. At this point, Daniel is probably a little shook. He's seeing the society that he helped build. Because one thing you can say about Nebuchadnezzar, the trains ran on time. Everybody had some food in the pot. Everybody was took care of. But woe unto a country when the wicked run the country. Woe unto, woe unto society when we receive what we really deserve because we're wicked people, wicked rulers. But now Nebuchadnezzar has passed away and Belshazzar is on the scene. So now we have the servant of God, Daniel, worried about the future, worried about what's going to come in the future, what's going to come around the way. If that's you, if you're like, uh, if you're like our friend Daniel, and now you're starting to see things unravel, and you're a little nervous, and you're worried, well, this, this episode's for you. 
As we look in Daniel chapter number 7, in the first year of Belshazzar, this lets me know this takes place after chapter number 4 of Daniel. After God snatches up Nebuchadnezzar and get, takes out his heart of sanity and puts in a, a beast heart into the mind of Nebuchadnezzar and he humbles that arrogant king. Then a little later, his son comes on the scene, which is Belshazzar. So chronologically, this falls much earlier in the book of Daniel. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. And he wrote down the dream and he told the sum of the matter. Thanks be to God that Daniel took record of the dream and he writes what we can still see as that pebble is dropped in the pool of time and the ripples still take place and we're still seeing the effects of what happened to Daniel then, the visions that he saw. And now we can read it together because we believe that the Bible is divine and God used the hand of Daniel to inscribe his words and it will affect us today in our time in our culture. And Daniel declared in verse number 2, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of the heavens were stirred up in the great sea. We already see here as Daniel peers out over all of humanity, the culture, we see the world, the four winds. That's the four corners, north, south, east, and west, as the storm is starting to churn up the sea. But I, I want to let you know, if you look back in the book of Revelation, there is a sea also around the throne room. I believe it's in Revelation in chapter number four there's a throne but the sea around the throne is steady in fact we see that John the revelator the youngest of the disciples who grew to be an old man who wrote from the island of Patmos the dream that he saw of the throne room he saw that the water was calm around the throne even though the culture was stirred up in Daniel's vision the, the world scene was crazy and everybody was attacking and the, it seems like it was churning everything around the throne is calm because let me tell you this spoiler alert God is sovereign he's going he's to handle everything everything's going to be alright so we see here that Daniel sees that the, the, the earth is churning there's a storm but in the throne room of heaven the almighty the Elohim the Adonai the king of kings and the lord of glory everything's okay and everything's calm and we see in verse number 3 as Daniel starts to peer and see that these different kingdoms that arise up in fact it's the same dream that Nebuchadnezzar had about the statue of gold and the arms and the, and the chest and the feet and the legs and the thighs. Oh, it's the same dream over and over. In verse number 3 and 4 beasts came up out of the sea different from one another. The first beast in verse number 4, the first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then I looked, and behold, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. Of course, we can look at the text here. You, you can't know much about the Bible unless you know about history. You certainly can't know anything about the book of Revelation unless you know about the Old Testament. As all the imagery in the book of Revelation pulls from the Old Testament. But I want to let you know here, we already know who this is in verse number 4. As Daniel has saw this with his own eyes, he saw Nebuchadnezzar lose his mind. He saw him have the heart of a beast. It's almost a reflection of what has already took place in the life of Daniel. He saw Nebuchadnezzar acting like a beast, eating grass out of the field as the dew fell on his back as he was a wild man. And here in the first dream, he saw this, this lion with an eagle's wings. And history has shown us that the, the, the nation of Babylon, is, their symbol is a lion with wings. Isn't it ironic that this uh, lion stands up on two feet and given a mind of a man, whenever the mind of the man was given a mind of a beast, as we see that Daniel is already understanding that God is showing him as he unfolds the map and shows him that God's hand is behind history. He's behind it all. And he says again in verse number 5, And behold, another beast, the second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in his mouth and between its teeth, and it was told to devour, rise, and eat much flesh. So again, Daniel, but in the life of Belshazzar, if you look in chapter number 5, we understand that Belshazzar, his kingdom came down in one night by the power of Darius the Mede and, of course, Cyrus the Great. These are the Medes and the Persians. 
And you'll notice as he describes this beast, he says he's risen up on one side. That's because the Persians are more of a stronger race than the Medes. That's where we get Cyrus the Great. As they come in and march through history, Daniel is being shown that God's hand is in it all. He understands that in the mouth of this great bear were three ribs. Of course, that describes that the Medes and the Persians went through and destroyed Assyria, Pharaoh, and of course, Babylon, that they devoured these nations. And we see through it all that God's hand is involved in everything. This is not happenstance. In fact, we see that God scribes it and he gives it, into, it, gives it to Daniel to write down to prove that he is God. But that's not all. In verse number 6, Behold, after this, and I looked, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. At this point, we understand that Daniel looks through history. See, we have the, we have the ability to look over our shoulders and look past into the past. But Daniel's looking into the future. This is when Alexander the Great rises up. And through his dominion, he's called a leopard because he moves so quickly. He's given four wings because he, no, no great ruler at this time has ever moved as quickly as Alexander the Great as he goes throughout the whole, whole known world, spreading the Greek language, unifying the people. Alexander the Great did more for the gospel because the gospel was written in the Greek in the known world that they'll know about Jesus Christ. So Daniel sees again in his old ages when the wrinkles and life and time has wore him down that God who is the ancient of days who's in power and glory is still on top of things and he's still in control. We understand here that the lepers had four wings because they moved quickly and they had dominion and it was given to it. Then verse number 7, After this I saw in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast. This one has eluded theologians and Christians for years. They've argued about this. They fought about this. Some are still arguing about it, but to me it's already been settled. There's nothing confusing about it. Here Daniel says he sees a fourth beast. In fact, he does not even describe this beast. He only describes his teeth because he uses it to devour into pieces and he uses his feet to stamp out that which is left with his feet. It is different from all the other beasts before it in verse number 7 and it has ten horns. Daniel starts to see a worldly system start to rise up. It's different than all the other world religions, or not world religions, but all the other systems. In verse number 8, he starts to consider that it has ten horns. And behold, there came up among them a little horn. Before the three of the other first horns were plucked out by the roots, and behold, in this horns were eyes like the eyes of a man, speaking great things. If you're a modern day Christian and you're reading this, you might get so caught up in this section of the scripture. In fact, there are whole denominations and churches who are still today so caught up in this section of scripture that they ignore the rest of the text. They're so caught up in the big mouth horn with the big eyes that say such outlandish things against the Almighty and the Almighty God that they actually do not even see the next part of the verse. But let me elaborate on the horn. As our friend Daniel was peering down the corridors of time, he sees that there will be a Roman government that will rise up. There will be ten kings. And out of those ten kings, three of them will be plucked up and there will be one horn that will talk so much trash and excel itself against the most high. I want to tell you through history, this has already happened. As many dispensationalists and people who look into the future say, this has not yet happened, but history has showed us that it has happened. In fact, if you know anything about history, you know about Nero. In fact, there were three kings around him that were plucked up and died around his reign. He spoke uh, outlandish and blasphemy against the Most High God. Mentally ill, he persecuted the Christians like none other. In fact, history tells us that he would dip Christians in hot oil and hang them in his garden and in the afternoon set them on fire as if they were lampposts and simply walked through the garden and smelled the roses as Christians burned alive above his head. He has been known to throw Christians to the lions at the Circus Maximus to entertain the, ma to entertain the masses to persecute the Christians. 
to this little horn? The one running his mouth? The one who speaks blasphemy against the Most High God? Let us not focus on the little big mouth horn. Because the next verse eclipses it all. As now Daniel has been looking at all of history. He's peered through all the kingdoms that arise up. But now he sees the one kingdom that reigns with an everlasting kingdom that has no end. And verse number 9, and I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The Ancient of Days here is not, is not Jesus. This is the one that we read about in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter number 1, in the beginning God, the triune God. Here he's described as the Ancient of Days. He's not ancient because he has crow's feet. He's not ancient because he has moles and his skin is withered. He doesn't have an hearing aid. He doesn't need a seeing eye dog and he certainly needs a walker. Here I want to tell you he's the ancient of days because he's been around a long time and he will continue to be around. He is the ancient of days is the way our friend Daniel describes him. He took his seat. Not that he needed to sit down, but that's his place of authority. He, I want to let you know that the Psalms tells us that the earth is his footstool and that the heavens cannot contain his glory. This is the ancient of days. But what about that little, little horn with the big mouth? Who cares about the horn with the, little, with the big mouth? Here's the ancient of days taking his seat upon the throne. His clothing was white as snow. That means there was no corruption in him. There's nothing shady. and There's no wrinkle in his attire. He, he is white as snow. His judgments are holy. His ways are holy. He's righteous in all his endeavors. Here, as Daniel starts to describe, the hair of his head was pure as wool. That even his thoughts and the outskirts of who he is, who he is the, the fringes of who he is, is pure. His throne was fiery flames. He was sitting on a chariot. As we read about the chariot of God, as we understand with Elijah and Elisha when he's caught up in the whirlwind, that God is fire. He's consuming. And verse number 9, a stream of fire issues and comes out before him. A thousands and a thousand serve him. And ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. But what about the horn? The one who's saying all those bad things. What about the horn? He's so mean. He, he's devouring God's people. Church, do you not see the one who is the ancient of days seated on the throne? That the fire that comes before him devours his enemies. That he has servants that are a thousands times ten thousands at his feet and they stand before him, beckoning to him, answering his call, ready to serve the Almighty, the El Shaddai, the great I Am. Here he is. It seems like it's the, the little horn is not even a footnote in history. Who cares about the little horn? I, I know you're probably at home and you're packing up beans, bullets, and band-aids and getting ready for the apocalypse. You probably are. And, and there's, nothing wrong being not, there's nothing wrong with being concerned about our society. But many of you are looking for an antichrist to stand up upon the scene and devour the church. But I want to let you know that God is on the throne. He is sovereign, and He's very well and able to defend His bride. He is God, and He reigns. Nothing can stay his hand. No one can say, what are you doing? You can't do that. He is God. And we see, he says, that they stand before him in verse number 10, and the court sat in judgment, and the books were open. Verse 11, Daniel continues, And I looked then because of the sound of the great words of the horn as he was speaking. Don't get me wrong. The horn is running his mouth. In fact, Daniel looks into the throne room and he hears the little noisy horn over on his shoulder running his mouth. And it was loud enough to capture his attention just for a moment in verse number 11. And I looked. The beast was killed. It didn't say how it was killed. In verse number 11, it just says, he did. If you put it out, put it in Greek, put it in Spanish. 
country. It don't matter. He dead. The, the king kills the beast. The, the champion slays the dragon. Here we see that the horn that was speaking is no longer speaking. In fact, I looked and the beast was killed and his body destroyed and given over to burn with fire. Just like that. The great I am speaks just like that. The, the dominion of this world crumbles before his speech just like that. The big mouth little horn is silenced just like that. As for the rest of the beast in verse number 12, their dominion was taken away, but their lines were prolonged for a season and a time. This tells me it lines right up with the storybook found in the book of Revelation. It is a kaleidoscope. It's a beautiful story that folds over on itself. It's the same story to repeat it over and over. We don't need the Omega code. We don't need Bible code. We don't need to decipher what the book says. We just take it at its value, knowing that it's apocalyptic, knowing that it's basically poetry, telling us the redemptive story of Jesus, how he died for his people, and how he dominates the world scene. And he reigns. However, we do read in the book of Revelation that the kingdoms come and they bow down before God as he reigns. That's why verse 12 says, as for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away. That means they don't have any power, but their lives were prolonged for a season and for a time. That means they still exist. That tells me, and it lines up with the book of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and the book of Revelation, that the kingdoms of this world will still function, but God will reign on the earth. In verse 13, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, in the clouds of heaven, there was one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. If you've heard that phrase before, I know you have if you've read your Bible, the Son of Man. That was Jesus' favorite phrase. He called himself the Son of Man. Whenever Jesus would walk among the scholars, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, he would refer to himself as the Son of Man. What he's doing is referring to this text. He's referring to Daniel chapter number 7, saying that I am deity. I am the one who's presented before the Ancient of Days. I am the one that all dominion has been given to. So when he ascribes to, his, to himself the nickname, the Son of Man, he's saying that he is the one that's been prophesied about, the one that will bring all dominion under him, and he will reign. And it says, and to him, <laughs> and to him in verse 14, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And this kingdom, one, shall not be destroyed. Who's that talking about? Is that the Pope? It's got to be the Pope, right? Is that Donald Trump? It's got to be Donald Trump. He's our guy. It's, it's got to be Joe Biden. It's got to be him. He's the hope for the future. I want to let you know this is not a democratic process this is not it's not where we get to cast our vote here this is not this is this is what took place is what taking place for this is jesus the chosen one the great i am the redeeming lamb that died for sinners who died like a lamb but has raised like a lion who has dominion and everlasting kingdom he reigns now he reigns now and the earth is his footstool the earth is filled with his glory and he does it through his church he does it through his people we are the hands and feet of his dominion and we go out and conquer Jesus reigns now it's not a future coronation there's not to be a day when he sits down and then we put the crown he reigns now he ascended on high when the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms who is this king of glory lift up your eyes O gates who is this that's what he came into the kingdom of heaven and he came with all kinds of people in the trail of his robe who were chained with your people who were possessed who were held captive now in the train of his robe what does that mean well in Roman times whenever a general would, would go into uh, 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 and he would come home to Rome he would send a messenger to run into the city and say, hey, we won, and we're getting ready to come into the city. 
So what they would do is fill the city with all kinds of fragrant petals and they would cover the stench of Rome and have a beautiful smell as the king would march in. And the citizens of Rome were invited to walk out with that general to walk into Rome as a victor. That they would walk in together as they would walk in through the gates saying we won. He conquers. He, de- he de- decimated the enemy. That's what we read here. That Jesus who was coronated already king of glory Lord who reigns before the ancient of days who has received all dominion and power that there will never be an end to his reign there will be no hanging chads there will not be any corrupt machines that vote him in he is God so who cares who's in the White House who cares who's the mayor who cares who cares who's the senator there is a throne in the heavens and I know everything's going to be all right because my God is on the throne and there won't be an impeachment there won't be a recall there won't be a re-election there will not be a passing of power there won't be a January 6th when we storm the Capitol they already tried that in the book of Genesis when they start to build the Tower of Babel he came in and shut all that down he is God and he reigns but to come full circle we see an aged Daniel bent over by time as he has served Nebuchadnezzar, now his crazy son is on the scene. It's like everything's going off the rails. God, where are you? What's the plan for your people? God simply opens up eternity and shows Daniel that he is everlasting. He has dominion and he reigns. You just need to understand. I know you're watching. You're worried about the times and the seasons. You're worried about Israel, the Middle East war. You're worried about the economy. There's a throne. And everything around the throne is calm. If God were to wring his hands and start to pacing, he gets sweaty and worried. That's when you need to start worrying. But he is sovereign. He's the Almighty and he reigns. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And everything, everything's going to be all right. Because Jesus is King. 